This lesson is on conservation of energy. When we talk about conservation of energy, we're talking about the fact that energy is neither created or destroyed, but only changes form. When we have energy goes into a system, all of that energy that went into the system, all of it comes back out of the system in some form or another. It may not be in the form we want, but it will. everything that goes in comes out. For example, let's say that we are going to turn a nuclear energy into electricity. Let's look at where the energy goes in this process. First, we're going to turn, use the nuclear reactor to create heat. So here's our nuclear reactor and the, the rods and the, and the nuclear reactor are pulled out to let the nuclear reaction start. That then generates heat, which heats up this water that's pumped through the reactor. And that creates heat in the water here in the steam generator that generates steam that then is pushed into the chamber where the turbine is. This turns the turbine, which Likewise, it's connected to the, to the generator, and that then, the generator is actually what we want turning to provide the electricity. And so we f finally, we get the electricity out. Now, the, we only wanted one type of energy, electricity. But you can see in this process, there's a lot of things happening uh, to allow us to get the electricity. Heat energy was transferred to the environment around the reactor that we talked about earlier, earlier that then was pumped through the system to heat water that provided the steam to turn the turbine. And then there was this water that was the steam that's generated to turn the turbine has to be cooled and that's where this cooling tar comes in and it then generates, uh, takes water and cools it, pumps it through the steam gener uh, turbine area to t turn that water or steam back into water that is then pumped back into the steam generation chamber. So we have a, uh, a lot of energy is used in getting the steam to turn the turbine. And of course, there's friction in the, between the turbine and the generator, so we lose energy there as well. So in the end, we get the electricity out that we want, but we also use a lot of other energy in the process for all these other processes to turn this turbine. But in the end, all the nuclear energy that is generated uh, by the, in the reactor vessel itself, all of that energy is used not just for electricity, but not just to produce the electricity, but for all these other processes to actually get to the point that the generator is turning to provide us electricity. So all the energy that's generated by the nuclear reactor is used in this process somewhere. Energy is in two forms, potential and kinetic energy. In the diagram here, we show the, the two forms of energy. In the left-hand side, we see a ball that is sitting at the top of a hill. The energy in that ball is stored. It's not being used at the moment. It's waiting to do work. That is potential energy. It could happen. On the right side of the diagram, we see the ball has been pushed off the top of the hill and is now rolling down the hill. That energy is kinetic. It's happening. The energy is doing work as it rolls down the hill. Moving the ball from the top of the hill to the bottom of the hill. Like everything in engineering, we have to be able to quantify energy. So we come up with then 
formulas that we use to quantify both potential and kinetic energy. As we said earlier, then the kinetic energy and potential energy, the, the total, then is always a constant. The kinetic energy and potential energy we start out with must equal the kinetic energy and potential energy that we end up with. You'll drive these formulas in physics later. The kinetic energy is equal to one-half the mass in kilograms times velocity in meter per second squared. Potential energy is equal to the mass times gravity, which uh, gravitational constant of wherever you are located, times height in meters. Now notice kinetic energy has velocity in the formula because the energy is moving. Potential energy does not have velocity because it's not it's potential, it's static, it's not moving at, the, at that time. So you have, we use the gravitational constant which shows the energy that it has stored based on the height of that particular mass. So Let's look at a particular case. When we drop a mass, m, some height h above ground, when you, right before you drop it, it has, it's all potential energy, right? It's stored. It's ready to be used, but it's not being used at that time. So the potential energy at that point, all the energy that it has is potential, and that's equal to mass times gravity times height. When we, then, when the, the mass is dropped at, as it falls right before it hits the ground, all of that potential energy is convert, is equal to the kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy, of course, remember, is one-half mass times velocity squared. So when we, we can equate these, mass times gravity times height equals one-half mass times velocity squared. Now we want to, what we want to do is solve for velocity right at the point of impact with the ground. So when you solve this equation, if you look at this equation, mass times gravity times height equals one-half mass times velocity squared. Okay, we want to solve it for velocity. You can see the very first thing you do is you divide by mass. The mass goes away. So the very first thing you realize that the velocity of a object as it falls is dependent only on the gravitational force that it has of the, uh, wherever you're located and the height that you hold the mass above the ground. The mass itself, whether it be a 40 pound anvil or a one ounce feather or less than one ounce feather, it doesn't matter. The mass doesn't count because it's strictly the gravitational force and the height that the mass is being held at that really determines the velocity. So now when you drop a feather, remember the feather, if it's in air, will, will float down and be affected by the air. But if you drop the feather and the anvil inside a vacuum where there is no air, they'll both fall at the exact same rate based on the falling from the same height. So when we solve that equation, we then get the equation that's shown here that velocity is equal to the square root of 2 times the gravitational force and gravitational constant at that point times the height. So now let's talk about gravity that we, we're going to be using in these calculations and these formulas. Gravity is a pull of an object towards the center of mass of a celestial body like the Earth or the Moon or the Jupiter or Saturn. And each of these planets has its own gravitational constant based on the mass of the celestial body. So, for instance, the Earth has a is larger than the moon, so the gravitational constant of Earth is greater than the gravitational constant of the moon. 
but Jupiter is larger than Earth, so it has a much bigger gravitational constant than Earth. The gravitational constants are used to determine the force or the weight of an object on that planet. So this, if we use Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, which you'll learn in physics, or if you've already had physics, you've already seen this, which means then that the force equals mass times gravity, or that's weight equals mass times gravity. So that weight or force is equal to the mass times the gravitational constant. Now, on Earth, we have two, we use two constants. One is for the U.S. system, one is for the metric system. Uh, the, in the U.S., we use the feet and seconds, so the gravitational constant is 32.2 feet per second squared. In the metric system, it's 9.81 meters per second squared. Remember, the gravitational constant is an acceleration. Remember, acceleration is velocity per time. So that's why you know, acceleration is velocity per time or per seconds. So acceleration then is you know, distance per seconds per seconds. Therefore, acceleration is distance per second squared. That's why the gravitational constant is a distance like feet or meters per second squared because it's acceleration. So what is the force or weight of an object on Earth that has a mass of 1,000 kilograms? Well, we know that the force or weight is equal to mass times gravity, so we then take the mass of 1,000 kilograms times the gravitational force, and since we're in using metric kilograms, we'll go ahead and use the metric constant, 9.81 meters per second squared, which gives us then 9,810 kilograms meters per second squared, or 9,810 newtons, because a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So now, go to your uh, workbook and look at the conservation of energy problems that are in the workbook and go then to the next video and watch it to show you how to do those problems.